Well, it took over a month, but Batman 89 Issue 4 is finally out. So once again, it's time for us to dive into the many Easter eggs and references in the Batman 89 comic series. But before we start, I want to add something we missed in the last video. In Issue 3, as we pointed out recently, Joe Quinones' art references a lot of Michael Anthony Jackson's storyboards for Batman Returns, including this shot of Catwoman leaping, this shot of Catwoman jumping from a roof, and even a bit of this shot of Batman standing at the edge of a building. I discovered this in my research for the unused concept art for Batman Returns, so check out that episode if you haven't already. Now, finally, onto issue 4. The issue opens with police attacking protesters. If Bullock's behavior seems out of character, that's likely because writer Sam Hamm could be drawing from the early versions of Bullock, who was a corrupt antagonist working for the villain Mayor Hill. While some have seen a resemblance of Bullock to Bob Hoskins in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the model for Bullock could also be Robert Costanzo, who voiced Bullock in Batman the Animated Series. Quinones' Bullock even has a mole on his cheek similar to Costanzo. As hell breaks loose, Drake Winston's Robin provides assistance, until Commissioner Gordon arrives to break it up. Fans may notice that Gordon identifies himself as Commissioner James T. Gordon, instead of the traditional James W. Gordon. This is actually a carryover from Sam Hamm's Batman 2 script, which referenced Gordon as Commissioner J.T. Gordon. As Drake's Robin looks over everything, he drapes his cape in front of his face, a reference to Tim Drake on the cover of Robin No. 1. Robin's pose on the rooftop is also meant to echo Batman's in issue 1 of the series. Another observation is that Robin's costume does seem to derive from his mechanic uniform, which were his main clothes in the original draft for Batman Returns. In the next scene, Bruce wears a very familiar shirt that fans may recognize as the quick-change Bruce Wayne action figure from the Kenner series, with the red part being a heart monitor as opposed to a bat symbol. Here's another look at a collage version made by friend of the podcast Logan Wood. Our fans will also recognize this as a shirt I've worn in previous episodes as well as conventions. Back at the hospital, Harvey has to decide between getting his face reconstructed by Swiss doctors or staying in Gotham to help his community. After flipping the coin to the tune of the clashes, should I stay or should I go, he decides to stay in Gotham. This is similar to his original appearance where his first coin flip was based around whether he should wait for the reconstructive surgery. The coin in both versions tells him no. This leads Harvey to knock out an orderly and escape, which is something he did in Batman Annual 14, The Eye of the Beholder. Harvey then reaches a mirror where he sees his scarred reflection for the first time the blue burns with the white hair being reminiscent of the Batman the Animated Series version of Two-Face. Funny enough, this issue was released on December 7th, which is, according to an old DC calendar, apparently Two-Face's birthday. In the next scene, we see Drake setting a Robin free, an obvious tie into his superhero name. Drake then gets into the car with Alfred and listens to Ice T's The Hunted Child, as we can see from the lyrics. Robin listening to a Walkman is also part of his description in the Daniel Waters script for Batman Returns. Meanwhile, Bruce reads up on Drake, and, as pointed out by fan of the podcast Rob O'Connor, the font on the Burnside Banner newspaper is similar to the one on the Gotham Globe in the 89 movie. Alfred brings Drake to Wayne Manor, where we see the Grand Staircase. We didn't get to see this in the Burton films, but it does look similar to the one in the Flash trailer. Drake sees the portrait of Bruce's great-grandfather, Preston Wayne. Funny enough, in Sam Hamm's Batman 2 script, Bruce's great-grandfather was a Union war hero named General Oliver Wayne. Robin seems to have a weird connection to Bruce's ancestor in both the comic and the script. In the Batman 2 script, the future Robin hid out on the streets by General Wayne's statue, while in this version, Preston Wayne bought out the family business of Robin's ancestors. In post-crisis continuity, Bruce's great-grandfather wasn't named Preston or Oliver, but named Kenneth Wayne. The name of Preston Wayne also sounds like Preston Payne, the third Clayface, though this is likely a coincidence. When Bruce meets with Drake, he's wearing the classic black turtleneck that he wore in the Burton films. They're also meeting in the same study where Bruce and Alfred talked in 89. During the scene, Bruce and Drake start fighting in Wayne Manor, with Bruce showing impressive moves, which leads Drake to confirm his suspicion that Bruce is Batman, shortly before Alfred barges in with a taser. This is actually how Sam Hamm wrote Dick Grayson discovering Bruce's identity in the 1986 draft for the 89 movie, where Bruce and Dick fought right down to Bruce throwing him into a wall, Dick realizing Bruce was Batman based on his moves, and Alfred barging in, though armed with a gun, rather than a taser, in the script. Drake's detective skills here also reflect his namesake, Tim Drake, who also figured out Bruce's identity in A Lonely Place of Dying. Drake's encounter and discovery of Bruce's identity is also reminiscent of Sam Hamm's Batman 2 script. In both versions, Robin is a vigilante on the streets who tries to fight Batman in their first meeting, believing that Batman is trespassing on his turf. Robin later sees Bruce Wayne unmasked and wearing the Batsuit in the script, while in the comic, Drake caught him donning a mask and rushing in to fight crime. In both scenarios, Robin has an opportunity to give Batman up to the cops, but decides not to. Next, we see Catwoman go undercover as Selina Kyle to meet Barbara Gordon. 
As indicated by our friends at Daily Batman Anthology, her purple suit and green scarf are reminiscent of the classic Catwoman outfit. Here, Selina's obviously back to wearing the glasses and doing her hair like she did in Batman Returns before she became Catwoman. It's also established that Catwoman's secret identity was never publicly revealed as Selina, which is how she can use her real name now, and Max Shrek's death is an unsolved murder. Among Selina's references is the Cohen Group. This is likely a reference to Dennis Cohen, who did the art for Sam Hamm's arc Blind Justice back in 1989. Selina's meeting with Barbara gets interrupted when the police arrive. Joe Quinones models the cops here after friends of his, including modeling the detective after Batman 89 writer himself, Sam Hamm. Quinones also modeled this beat cop after DC editor Andy Marino, and this other cop after editor Andy Corey. It's also worth noting that the beat cops are dressed like the cops in 89. The group is on the hunt for Harvey Dent, who's dressed in a fedora, like he was in his first appearance in the original Detective Comics number 66. He also looks similar to Two-Face in his debut in Batman the Animated Series. Two-Face fights off the cops and eventually escapes to the subway tunnels where he finds his hideout. With one side good and one side bad, it's similar to Two-Face's first hideout in Detective Comics number 66, and of course, Two-Face's hideout in Batman Forever. Later, Bruce and Drake dine in Wayne Manor in the same dining room as in 89, though Drake is sitting way closer than Vicky this time. If you notice, Bruce is seen drinking water instead of wine, since remember, one drink and he's flying. Drake brings up that he figured out Bruce's identity partially through his body language, and that Bruce cocks his head when he's nervous. This is somewhat reminiscent of the unmade Tom Mankiewicz Batman script, where Silver St. Cloud put two and two together when Bruce and Batman both twitch their jaw. It also resembles how Dick Grayson figures out Bruce's identity in the New 52. Bruce brings Drake into the Batcave, which begins the Batman and Robin partnership. At one point, Drake stands by the caged bat from 89. Bruce explains to Drake that he didn't build the Batcave so much as he found it and fixed it up. This is similar to Sam Hamm's 1986 script, where Batman actually did mention discovering the cave as a boy to Vicki Vale. This line, however, was cut. Drake takes a liking to the new Bat Cycle. This is an original design by Joe Quinones, and as we can see, is not based off of the Toy Biz version of the cycle. It also features the same back fins as the 89 Batmobile, as well as the yellow headlights. Bruce agrees to team up with Drake with a tease for the next issue being Robin and Batman The Man Wonder. And that brings us to the end of the issue. Big thanks to my research assistant Dan for helping to put together a lot of the visuals for this episode, and to our friend John Hefner of About Faces for the Two-Face scan of Detective Comics 66 that came from his blog. Also big thanks to Joe Quinones and Sam Hamm for their kind words on these analyses, with Quinones recently telling us, quote, you know you have a wonderful eye, to which a friend of ours would say, yeah, some think he has too. If you want to check out an alternative fan-made comic set in the Burtonverse, check out our friends at Batman Enigma, until then, I'm Ben Juan, and if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and as usual, do us a favor, tell all your friends about us.